think about how you are interpreting events in a way that kind of keep you from either surviving better or keep you from thriving. It fits into both categories. And basically, here's the way it works. I want, to, I want you to get into the thinking about your thinking. You know, we have something called automatic thoughts. And so these are just ways that we immediately begin to think that's kind of pattern and habitual and built over maybe painful experiences. Your mind gets kind of wired to think in a certain way. And here's what happens. Let's take um, any area of life. Let's say you're single and you want to go out with somebody and you meet them and you call them or invite them for coffee or something like that. That's just a single event, right? And let's say they say no. All right. Or they don't call you back or they don't respond to your profile. All right. Single event. Or let's say you're a salesperson and you call on a customer and they don't buy your product. Or let's say that you go um, on a job interview and you don't get hired. Or let's say you try to make a new friend and mingle at a party and somebody doesn't show much interest in next steps, whatever it is. OK, um, let's say that you're an aspiring author and you write a manuscript and you submit it to a publisher and you get rejected. I have actually somewhere in this office, um, I'm reorganizing, so it's probably, it's somewhere around here. I have, um, I have a, uh, I framed it because I use this with my girls um, to help them see that we run into an obstacle. It doesn't mean failure, but I have framed from a publisher um, when I wrote my first book, I have um, a letter of rejection framed from one of the biggest publishers back then, read my manuscript and sent it back and said, um, dear, dear Dr. Cloud, basically, thank you for submitting your manuscript, but this is not, this is not a book that anybody would ever want to read. I suggest maybe you look at an academic journal and submit it there, but it's not really a book that's worth publishing. Well, okay. That book, um, now has, uh, after I've found a publisher, um, I don't know, it's a couple of million copies. It actually survived and it thrived, right? But here's the deal. What if I treated that one rejection as failure? More specifically, let's talk about that one event, asking out a date, going for a job interview, getting a manuscript accepted, whatever it is, trying to make a sale. That's one event. You get a no or you get a rejection or you throw an interception as a quarterback. One event. Here's what people that thrive do. They don't use that event interpreting it as one of the one or more of the three P's. So what does that mean? Here's the three P's personal, pervasive, and permanent. Here's how it works. I get the rejection letter back for my book. By the way, you know John Grisham, the author? I think his first book, Time to Kill, was rejected by 35 publishers. I think that's right. You, you could Google it and probably find out. But what if he had interpreted it with the three Ps? I get a rejection letter. First P, personalize it. It means something about you that's bad, personally. I guess I can't be an author. I guess I don't know how to write. I guess nobody will ever go out with me. I guess I'm not pretty enough, not smart enough, not successful enough, or I'll never get hired by that company. I'm not the kind of person that companies would hire. Something that we use that event and we interpret it negatively about ourselves as opposed to, that's just one rejection, it's just one event. What can I learn from it? How can I do better? Morph the manuscript, whatever. OK, but it gets personalized about you and then your heart sinks. Well, I guess I am a loser. OK, personal. The second P, pervasive. Well, it's not just my writing. I mean, it's not just this book. It's every project I do. I, it never goes well. And I'll never, you know, all companies are like this. All publishers are like this. And it's not just my writing. You know, it's my golf game, too. And and. I mean, the town I live in sucks and the whole world is, it, it just goes pervasive. Everything goes all bad. It's just like a falling rock. And that event proves to us not only that I'm not any good personalized, but 
pervasive. It's not just this area, it's every area that's bad and everything goes dark. And then the third P is permanent. So I think, well, I'm gonna send it next week, but next month it won't be any different. Or I'm gonna to try to keep dating on the site and it's not gonna be any different next month or in the next interview. And we add the, it's gonna be permanent. It's not gonna change. And then we get depressed, the three Ps. Now that is a cognitive style of pessimism that we know is empirically empirically proven as a style that ends up in not achieving not thriving sometimes not feeling like we're surviving ends up depression anxiety and a bunch of other stuff same same event with somebody that doesn't have that thinking style they don't interpret it with the three p's they don't personalize it they don't think everything is bad and they don't think it's always going to be bad but they adapt and they keep moving. So I want you to think about whatever area you are struggling in right now and um, ask yourself, how am I thinking about this? Is it slowing me down because I've interpreted it with the three Ps? Watch this. Now, this is a skill, people. I want to, you know, you are not stuck with this thinking. You are in control of your thinking once you get above it and start to realize I can change how I think about stuff. And you can. I remember Olivia, our oldest, um, she was, uh, she, had a, she had a teacher in about the seventh grade or so ish. No, it was younger than that. It's probably about the fourth grade, great teacher, but high expectations. And boy, she was tough. And Olivia went through a little bit of worrying about school. What if I, what if she calls on me? What if I don't have my homework, you know, perfect and all this. And so she, <laughs> she found herself kind of like not being able to go to sleep. And so one night she's lying there kind of worried about the next day. And, and she calls me in there and I went in there and she said, Danny, I can't sleep. I can't sleep. How do you get to sleep? I can't sleep. I said, well, Olivia, try, try counting sheep. Okay. And she says, what's that? And I said, well, you count them, you close your eyes and you watch them in your head jump over the fence and you just keep counting them and keep counting them. Don't stop counting them, just keep counting them. If it goes to 10,000, I don't care, just keep counting them and you'll fall asleep. But don't worry about it, just keep counting them. So I leave her room and about probably 10 minutes later, daddy, daddy. And I go in there, Olivia, she goes, my sheep keep crashing into the fence. They can't jump over. I go, Olivia, they're your sheep. They're not my sheep. They're not, they don't belong to the neighbors. They're your sheep. You're in control of this. Make the sheep jump over, <laughs> jump over the fence. Sometimes we don't realize I actually can focus and begin to change the way I think about this. And this is a habit. It's a pattern. It's a muscle. It increases with practice. So I want you to start to work on your three Ps and notice I'm not going to think about it that way. I'm going to look at it differently. It's not permanent. It's not me. And I'm not a loser. I'm not going to think that. I'm going to think this. And just start to have your head go differently. You know, one of my favorite verses is in Psalm 139. It says, um, God, uh, test my anxious thoughts. Try my anxious thoughts. Look at my anxious thoughts and see if there's any hurtful way in me. What a description of, let me paraphrase that. God, help me look at my my anxious thoughts. Am I thinking in the three Ps? That's a hurtful way to think. I'm not going to think that way. I'm going to think differently. Another one of my favorite verses is Romans uh, 12. It says, by the transforming of your mind, this takes work to transform how we think about stuff. And when we do that, we can get to vastly different places. Okay. What if somebody said to Elon Musk, which I'm sure they did. Oh, you'll never get a, people to buy electric cars, you know, mass market electric cars. No, that's a novelty. That's only for blah, 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 blah. Well, he changed 
a lot of people's thinking about that now. Every car company is out there making electric cars, and on and on and on and on and on and on and on. And on. I mentioned uh, yesterday there was a. I said I'm going to tell you a story, and then we ran out of time. I didn't tell the story, but um, it's uh, a story of a friend of mine. A friend of mine um, who, if you are watching this on the internet on high speed internet on your phone or your iPad or your computer. You may be on cable, you may be, who knows how you're doing it, but there's a good chance, and especially in years past, that you watched the internet or went on the internet, broadband, fast internet. Remember dial up? When we moved from dial up to broadband? Well, DSL. So DSL, was the technology that did that. Okay, so my buddy, his name's Mark Floyd, he's floating along as a, as a, you know, he's in the tech industry. And the big carriers like Verizon and AT&T and all those were his customers. And about that time, this is back when there was still dial up mostly on the internet, all the big tech companies were looking at DSL technology. It was a new technology that they were exploring. And then the whole industry started to abandon DSL and go down a different direction. And so he's going to um, all the telecoms on his regular business. And while he's there, he asks them, why are you guys getting out of DSL? Because he had read about DSL. And it was the big promise of the future. And everybody's abandoning it. And he said, why is everybody dropping DSL? And he'd go to one of the carriers and they'd say, because copper wire can't handle DSL and the world is wired with copper wire. and copper can't handle it then he would ask well why can't it and they'd say well copper just can't handle it and he'd say why not and they'd say well copper can't handle it he never heard a why he never could get an answer it was a belief that copper wire can't handle the sl so he says well i'm gonna find out and he goes out and raises some money and puts a warehouse full of physicists out there to answer the question he didn't say go make dsl work he just gave him an assignment tell me why copper wire can't handle dsl i want to know while he's raising all that money i think it's forbes magazine did an article what does mark floyd know that nobody else knows everybody's abandoning dsl and he's out there trying to make it work what does he know that we don't know well he didn't know anything except that he hadn't gotten a good answer so here's what happened. His physicists came up with an answer and they said, actually DSL can handle, or copper wire can handle DSL. They just hadn't taken it up high enough to a certain frequency or crunching it or whatever, but it'll work. So then he goes and he starts to develop that technology and he ends up selling that technology. I think it went public at about six and a half billion dollars. and all of a sudden, <laughs> the world goes from dial-up to broadband on DSL. There was a pervasive belief that everybody accepted, didn't change their thinking, a belief that this couldn't be done, but it could. Same thing with a four-minute mile. For years and years, it was a belief that a human could not run a four-minute mile. And the, the doctors said, well, if they did, the human would die. And so it's a ceiling based on a belief. Well, then finally, somebody broke through the four minute mile barrier and the belief was shattered. And guess what happened? Very quickly, people all over the world started breaking the four minute mile. It was the belief that hadn't been questioned. So I want you to start questioning your limiting beliefs. Why can't you go get that? next certification to change your career? Or why can't you go learn what causes the anxiety you're suffering from and learn that there are answers? Go to our boundaries.me forward slash anxiety seminar. You can learn about this. Whatever belief it is is holding you back, especially in the three Ps, I want you to question that because beliefs sometimes are not true. The earth is not flat. Somebody had to question that. <laughs>
glad they did. Now we can have satellites, right? And other cool stuff. All righty.